Hello and thank you for watching DC Statehood Today, the show that keeps you informed on the latest DC Statehood news. I'm your host, Denisha Richard. You can watch us on DC TV and online on YouTube. You can also follow us on Twitter at DC51 Today. United States Representative Ruben Gallego is the 133rd co-sponsor of H.R. 317 or the New Columbia Admission Act. Gallego is the Democratic representative for the 7th District of Arizona. We would like to thank him for helping make the District of Columbia the 51st state in the Union. Right fielder for the Washington Nationals, Bryce Harper, has publicly showed his support for D.C. statehood. He wore a shirt with 51st state printed on it before his game against the Chicago Cubs. This display is public evidence that he is in favor of ending the disenfranchisement of D.C. residents and his support for D.C. statehood. Actress Ashley Judd has also publicly supported D.C. statehood. The actress stated her support during the D.C. statehood luncheon at the Democratic National Convention, which included D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser and other elected officials as guests. D.C. statehood has been included in the Democratic National Convention platform, making it the first time the issue has been included since the year 2000. Members of the statehood delegation attended the convention, which took place at the Wells Fargo Arena in Pennsylvania, and at the convention, Hillary Clinton was announced to be the Democratic presidential nominee. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser visited the Republican National Convention to inform GOP supporters about D.C. statehood. The mayor believes that national outreach will gain Republican support of the D.C. statehood movement. Mayor Bowser says the Republican Party should support statehood, stating that the party values states' rights and local control. According to a Brookings Institute article, 78% of Americans believe that D.C. does have congressional representation. After being presented with the correct information in reference to D.C. statehood, 82% believe that D.C. should have representation in Congress. The survey also stated the need for people around the country to be informed on D.C. statehood. And if you have an iPhone or Android, you can keep up with all the D.C. statehood news by downloading an app appropriately titled D.C. Statehood. The app provides you with the latest information on the D.C. statehood movement. Now stay tuned for our interview segment and hear from several individuals making great strides in the D.C. statehood movement. Hello and welcome to the D.C. statehood today show. My name is Franklin Garcia and today we have in the studio Mary Eva Condon. Thank you for being here, Mary. Mary is actually the uh, national committee woman for the Democratic Party here in the District of Columbia, and she's also a super delegate. So, Mary, uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you have been doing in the community all these years that you've been active. Well, welcome. I'm so happy to be welcomed back to Brookland. This is where I grew up. Uh, my parents were married at 12th and Monroe at St. Anthony's. My mother, when she got married, was living at 13th and Lawrence. And I went to Catholic University's grade school when I grew up, as did my four siblings. Anyway, this is my home, and it's wonderful to be back, and I was so glad that you invited me, Franklin. Well, when I came back from college, I immediately got involved in Young Democrats and Ward Democrats, and then when partial home rule was passed, and I had helped uh, register voters to pass home rule in 1974, I was um, hired as the first executive director of the D.C. Democratic Party following home rule. So I had the great opportunity to help all wards write their constitutions for the Democratic, to be related to the Democratic State Committee and then the Democratic National Committee, as well as the precinct. So I'm so proud to have been part of small d democracy being built in DC. And of course at that time, sta the statehood movement was so exhilarating because we had won partial home rule and we thought we were going to go on rather quickly to gain voting rights or statehood. And it was a very sad day when we realized that the state legislatures throughout the country were being influenced by the Republican Party and not going, allow, going to allow us to gain statehood. 
a lot of history there. Wow, yes, incredible. Yes. Now, I know you're very involved in the uh, delegation process and the uh, convention. Uh, can you talk a little bit about and let people know when the convention is taking place, where and how they can get there if they want to? Yes, the Democratic National Convention this year is from July 25th to 28th, Monday through Thursday in um, Philadelphia very close to D.C. and uh, of course also the, the, the birthplace of democracy and the Liberty Bell and everything so it's a great place for us Democrats to celebrate. Uh, the D.C. Democratic State Committee has organized a bus to take uh, delegates as well as um, statehood and D.C. friends up to the convention but uh, on Sunday the 24th but the thing that everybody has to understand is that there's a limited number of credentials at a, any convention. And there's also a limited number of uh, the people the firefighters will allow in an entity. So credentials and getting into a convention is very hard. But there's so many activities going on around a convention and opportunities to lobby especially for our efforts on statehood. And our efforts, D.C. Democratic Party's efforts for statehood have been going on since every Democratic convention since, well, probably before, but in my experience, since 1976. Wow. And, and what are some of the events uh, that the Democratic Party, the local party, is doing to try to uh, do some outreach for statehood while at the convention? Well, the, sp the, the uh, direct lobbying effort will be the delegates on the floor who are seated in different, every state has a different place to sit. We will be going, be uh, distributing ourselves or delegating ourselves to go out to other states while the delegates are on the floor to say, you know, to, to lobby them personally for statehood and to talk to them about the pros. And we aren't going to promote the cons, but we will certainly try to uh, demean the cons. And uh, that's a very uh, important thing because, you know, delegates to a convention are pretty well politically tied. So we really need to convince them. And I have been um, surprisingly distressed at times when I have gone out to different states on the floor and they they push back um, statehood because of uh, something like they think that uh, our government officials perhaps haven't uh, warranted the right to statehood and I I have always gone back to them I mean I'll never forget going to the Rhode Island delegation and they told me that they would never consider statehood as long as I don't want to mention which one but not as so-and-so was in government I said you're from Rhode Island and you're gonna talk to me about corruption in government I mean we really have a lot to work on throughout the, the nation so that we can get statehood passed. Now, now since 2000, uh, statehood hasn't been on the DNC platform. Right. And it looks like it finally will make it this yes. time. How is that going to change? And how do you see uh, that impacting the statehood movement? Well, it's huge because we can hold the Democratic president to her word. And the word of the Democratic Party that we are going to fight for statehood, and it is a voter suppression issue. If anyone, as we Democrats are, are against voter suppression, we have to promote D.C. statehood, because the worst example of voter suppression is D.C. citizens not being able to vote. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Mary Eva. It's a great joy for me, Franklin. You've been a great statehood advocate. I really appreciate it. And we, D.C. natives, all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. My name is Franklin Garcia. My guest has been Mary Eva.
Condon, the National Committee Woman for the District of Columbia. We hope you continue to watch us. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the DC Statehood Today Show. And today we have in our studio, Miss District of Columbia, Ciara Jackson. Welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Well, I would start uh, with the basics. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm a military kid, um, and my father served for 22 plus years in the military. My mother is a dentist. Um, I graduated from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia studied political science, then I later went to the Women's Campaign School at Yale University. Um, I'm a recent White House intern, um, and I was just recently crowned Miss District of Columbia three weeks ago. Um, I promote the platform Behind the Front Line, which seeks to support military children, and that's something that's close to my heart, being a military child myself. Um, I've worked to create a book um, that I've written, a children's book called CC the Military Kid, and even um, been shouted out by the First Lady on her Instagram page and also featured in her Joining Forces campaign. And in the future, I plan to work with our members of Congress to advocate for ch uh, military children. Wow. I don't know if I voted for you, but if I didn't, I, I, I certainly will. Uh, <laughs> well, thank anyways, you. Uh, There's actually a way that people can vote for me. So I'll be competing for Miss America on September 11th, and we have an America's Choice, um, Viewer's Choice um, Award, and that person can be voted on um, from all the citizens in America. And I'm hoping that everyone in D.C. votes for me. Um, you can start voting in August. Great. Well, tell us then, uh, right there, tell us the difference between the various various contests that uh, young ladies can participate in in the District of Columbia. I know that there is the Miss USA pageant mm -hmm. and then there's also the Miss America. Can you tell us about the difference between the two and can DC uh, young ladies participate in both of them? Yes, I mean, aren't we so proud of our new Miss USA, Deshauna Barber? Um, she's a great representative of D.C., but also a great representative of our nation. But the difference between the Miss um, USA organization and the Miss America organization is that the Miss America organization was founded in 1921. Um, it was one of the first national, well, the first national pageant that we had in America. Um, and a little bit later down the road, a Miss America chose not to um, pose in swimsuit. So um, the swimsuit sponsor created their own pageant, and that is the birth of the Miss USA pageant. But women in the, in the district can compete for either pageant. Um, if you would like to compete for scholarships, you can always compete in um, the Miss America organization or the Miss USA organization. Um, and the age range normally ranges from 13 to 26 for both or for either or organization. Wonderful. So I'll mm. let you talk a little bit about uh, your platform. I know you started it at the introduction, but uh, talk a little bit about more how you plan to do outreach and what exactly is it that you uh, plan to do? So, like I said before, my goal is to really work with members of Congress to advocate for military children. Um, being a military child myself and dealing with a lot of, um, of the issues that came from my father having PTSD and being injured in war. Um, when I was young, he ran over a landmine, and because of that, he has a metal plate in his neck. Um, and that has caused a lot of other mental issues um, to his body and to himself um, that we as a family have had to work with. So my, my goal is to make sure that I'm speaking about those issues and allowing people to know that there are children that are also involved um, in these military families that are not completely understanding what has happened to their parents and that we need to give a lot of more attention to those children and make sure that they understand what it means to have a parent who is deploying before their deployment, during their deployment, and after their deployment. Um, and that there are also mental issues that come, like separation anxiety, for military children. And we need to talk to those children about the, the issues that, that come with um, that territory and we need to make sure that they are well prepared for, for deployments. Great. Now, you know that statehood is a big issue for a lot of uh, residents in our city. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, where did you stand on statehood and did you see your visibility being used to promote statehood? Yes, so I definitely support statehood. Um, I believe that it is um, very unfair that there are more than 600,000 citizens in D.C. that do not have a, a voice in Congress um, and that we pay more than $26.4 billion and we still 
do not have that voice in Congress. Um, so I think that with the role of Miss District of Columbia, I can definitely advocate on many different platforms, many different TV shows, radio shows, and different appearances throughout the district to make sure people know that it is very important and imperative that DC has equal statehood. So tell me, I know that now that you are our, <clears throat> our, our reigning uh, queen, um, how, how has your life changed? Uh, um, I bet that you have a lot of people who are trying to get to you so <laughs> that you can attend events. How do you, when, what was your life like before winning and today? Well, my life before is pretty busy. Like I said before, I was a White House intern. I was the chief of staff's communication intern and the only one during my time at the White House. So it was definitely a lot of hard work. Um, but now, um, going from intern life to, to Miss DC life has been very different. Um, interns, we work really hard, and so does, so does Miss DC. But I think the beauty in, in both um, roles that I've held is that I've been able to serve the people. Um, and that's something that I definitely, um, a quality that I would like to have throughout my life. So it's been a blessing for sure to be able to, to represent so many different Americans and citizens of the district. Wonderful. And so tell me at last, how do we get millennials? How do we engage more young people? to take on the cause of this statehood because that's going to be something key uh, for us to get statehood in the District of Columbia to involve more young people. How do you see, perhaps with your title, reaching out to more young people to get them to embrace statehood? I think a part of that is making sure that we're um, including them in our local government and allowing there to possibly even be junior city councilmen and, and, jun and junior mayors to be able to, to advocate and get kids involved in, in our um, local government and let them understand what we do in our local government. And by including them, they'll be able to speak to their friends at school and, and family members and get them, get them to know that D.C. statehood is something that's very important and that it impacts them too. And even though they may be under 18 and may not have the ability to vote, they soon will be 18 and have the ability to vote and we want them to be able to have um, equal representation in Congress just like so many other Americans have. Well wonderful we look forward to having you represent us on the national stage as Miss America and of course <laughs> voting for you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you and be sure to follow me on all of my social media handles Miss America DC. My name is Franklin. Thank you for watching DC State today. My guest has been Miss District of Columbia Sierra Jackson. I was born in Washington, D.C. in the 1940s. I remember cast iron horse troughs, riding in streetcars, watching the Senators play at the old Griffith Stadium. A lot's changed since then, but sadly one thing hasn't. D.C. residents do not have equal rights. That's why I support statehood. If you think D.C. residents deserve equal rights, call your Senator and tell them to support D.C. statehood. Call. Hello and welcome back to the DC Statehood Today show. And today we have in our studio former Mayor Sharon Pratt. Uh, she became only the third mayor in our nation's capital and uh, the first woman, African American woman, to head a major city. Uh, so we're very excited to have you. Welcome to the to the studio. Delighted to be here. Wonderful. So tell us a little bit about uh, after leaving office. What has been the life of? Uh, Mayor uh, Sharon Pratt. Oh, well, life is a lot quieter. So <laughs> um, I had remained busy. One thing, I am a grandmother three times over, so that's a good thing. Uh, I have an 11 and 9 and 4-year-old grandchildren, uh, but I have my own consulting firm. Uh, some of it is in the healthcare space, but a lot of my focus has been around uh, acquiring non-performing mortgages, which was, you know, the huge financial meltdown and the foreclosure crisis. So I've been involved with buying those mortgages and helping people stay in their homes, but also making a return for our investors. Great. Well, well let's not come back to the yeah. future yet. Right. Um, yeah. Take us back to 1990. I mean, we go back to the 90s, and I remember uh, homicides peaked at 495 in 91. We had uh, on national, really international television, our mayor being on television for the wrong reasons. Uh, our finances weren't you know, ideal, um, and here you come. Even though you had a very established national name, it wasn't so much of a household name locally. So how do you get in uh, and become uh, uh, the leader of the city at such a crucial time? Well, I think that there was uh, ultimately a hunger for change, uh, and I was a candidate who was stepping, who was speaking to that change. Um, I'd always been involved, very active, even bringing about home rule in the city, 
also had always been involved in elections in the District of Columbia, and I had been the elected Nash D.C. National Committee woman on for the Democratic Party. That's really how I got involved nationally. Um, and so, you know, while I had a lot of respect for Marion Barry, but I also felt that it was city needed change. I mean, we needed to become a part of the of a more modern world, a more cosmopolitan world. We had to recognize we could not be a source of patronage for everybody. Uh, and so I said, well, let me just begin that conversation. Not, you know, not certain that it would go anywhere, but I certainly cared enough about the city to begin the conversation. And next thing I know, over time, I mean, it was, I was out there two years. Uh, there began to build a sort of base of support. I felt like Robin Hood going from village to village, hamlet to hamlet, and along the way there were more and more people who joined that effort. Okay, great. And so um, I know that the current mayor, Maria Bowser, got arrested for statehood. So did the former mayor, Vincent Gray, and of course uh, Marion Barry had gotten arrested a number of times. Um, you also got arrested. Uh, what was the significance of being arrested back then? Is it the same message? Were you sending the same message then that you would send today? Well, I think, you know, what uh, Frederick Douglass said, it, power concedes nothing without a demand. And the reality is people in the District of Columbia, and I'm a Washingtonian, I'm a few generations Washingtonian, and for too long we've just been too complacent, accepting the status quo, accepting sort of a second-class citizenship. Uh, and the only way we got home rule was to protest. Uh, and it, th my sense was that we had to, you know, make it clear that we in the District of Columbia were not going to accept it. And so I think it's good that the mayor got arrested. I think it's good that I, I thought it was important that I get arrested. It wasn't so much I was eager to get arrested. I was eager to make the point that we are prepared to do whatever we need to do to be free, full citizens of the United States. And so moving to today's uh, time, uh, the current mayor, Maria Bowser, has an initiative where she is revisiting the Tennessee plan, which in essence uh, is a way to uh, demand statehood from the U.S. Congress. Um, the, there is going to be an initiative on the November 8th uh, ballot, which basically is going to ask citizens to approve the Tennessee plan, which are, uh, is a four-part question, really. Uh, it talks about whether people want to be a state. It talks about defining our boundaries and other things. Um, how do you see this new attempt at statehood? Um, should we think that this time it will really happen? I think it's great that the mayor is doing that. Uh, I think we will achieve statehood when the people of the District of Columbia become engaged enough to demand it. That's really all it will take. I know it sounds simplistic, but by and large, people are not engaged and they don't, you know, get involved. This process forces the people of the District of Columbia to take a stand. And hopefully, the people of the District of Columbia will say, sort of like the guy in the movie Network, where they lift, you lift the window, stick your head out and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And this is a vehicle by which the people of the District of Columbia can say that. So I think it's smart. I, I applaud the mayor for doing it. And do you think that now that the city is changing, the demographics of it are changing, do you think that that will have an impact on how we move forward with statehood? Well, I think it always hurt us that we were perceived to be such a, a non-white community. Uh, I think it did hurt us. I think uh, it isn't fair. It ought not to be. The more we are a fuller reflection of America, the le fewer arguments that can be advanced. But the reality is we all know that there are prejudices in our society. We certainly are experiencing and witnessing that today in America. So I think it was an added uh, uh, challenge for us in the District of Columbia. It never should have been, but it was in the same way probably as for Puerto Rico. Uh, so, uh, but I, but I, the key is the residents of the District of Columbia must come to the table saying, I'm empowered, I don't th accept this arrangement. And it was a very unique arrangement at the time of forming a very young country. I mean, that arrangement 
Matt Madison says in the Federalist Papers, even that they never intended for this situation to continue forever and ever. How can you fight, you know, the British, King George III, for everyone to be free and then make an arrangement where everyone who's in the capital, they're not free? And it's the only capital in the free world where we had this arrangement. So I think when the citizens get involved and the world is aware of it, then we will have statehood. Indeed a travesty. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to our studio today. I'm delighted to be here. Wonderful. Delighted. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Franklin Garcia, and my guest today has been Sharon Pratt, former mayor of the District of Columbia. We look forward to seeing you next time on this segment of This is Statehood Today. Thank you for watching us. You can watch us on DCTV and online on YouTube. You can also follow us on Twitter at DC51 Today. I am Denisha Richard and this is DC Statehood Today.